final reading this morning is the gospel reading. This is Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. And this good news, listen for God's word to you. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your Holy Spirit guide us through this familiar story about Peter's great confession of faith. And may we be both humble and courageous enough to hear within this story a reminder of the greatest calling that's been placed upon each one of our lives. So we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning with a little known fact about the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, it's not so much the gospel, but as I think most all of you know that we have four versions of the good news in our New Testaments. This is a shocker to most people. You hardly ever find the word church in the gospels. As a matter of fact, Mark, Luke, John never ever have the word church in them. Jesus says nothing about the church, the authors of those three gospels, nothing about the church. And if you're thinking, well, that's one gospel left, and we just heard you read from the gospel of Matthew, Jason, and the word church was in there, so it must be everywhere in Matthew? No. The word church is only mentioned really in two stories. Uh, The first one is one that comes a couple of chapters uh, after this one, the one that's talked about the most, and this is when... Jesus talks about what happens in the church when someone sins against you. And I imagine when you were a child or teenager at a Sunday school lesson or vacation Bible school, you may have had the rules told to you that this is how it's supposed to work in church if someone sins against you. Step number one, Jesus says in that passage, in the church, if someone sins against you, you go to them just one-on-one and you point out their sin to them and if they repent and say they're sorry, then that settles it. And we all know that's how that always happens, right? Yeah. But if they fail to repent, then you get a couple of church members with you and you go to the person and you point out their sin again and everyone likes to be ganged up on, right? So certainly that works. And then the final step is, if they still refuse to repent, you bring the person before the whole church. Oh, this sounds great. (laughs) And you point out their sin to them in front of everyone. And then if they still refuse to repent, you're supposed to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector, which is like an outsider. Uh, But if they do repent, then you let them back in eventually. After that little use of the word church, uh, Peter has now heard Jesus say it, so he comes up with a question. And he says, "Uh, but what if someone keeps on doing me wrong over and over and over again in the church? How many times do I have to forgive them? That's when Jesus tells him basically infinity, seven times 70, that you never, ever run out of forgiveness. So perhaps that part of the teaching sounds a little more gracious than bringing the person before everyone. 
Um, the word church and that little story is four times thrown in there. The only other time the word church is ever used is the first time it's used, and it's in this story right here, and it just comes out of nowhere. Let's look at what's taking place in this familiar story from Matthew's Gospel. We have Jesus with his disciples, and they're up in this northern region of Galilee where most of the Gospel story takes place except for Holy Week. And as they come to this district called Caesarea Philippi, Jesus stops to ask them a couple of questions. The first question is like a softball that's just lobbed right over the middle of the plate and easy for anyone to knock out of the park. He asks them, who do other people say? Who do people say the Son of Man is? And here we can almost see the disciples. If, if you kind of want to picture it here, you've got Simon, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, uh, Judas, a half dozen others of them. Can you see them kind of elbowing each other out of the way because the teachers asked a question and it seemed like, you know, pretty easy, generic kind of question. We all have an answer for that. And so these disciples are stepping forward, volunteering their answers. Well, some say baptizing John wasn't really beheaded, that somehow he escaped. And so maybe, maybe you're baptizing John. Another disciple steps forward. Oh no, you all fellows need to remember the great prophet Elijah never actually died. He was taken up by a tornado into the heavens after a fiery chariot separated him from Elisha. And so there are other people, they're saying the son of man is Elijah come back. Others still want to get in an answer to get on teacher's good side. And so they say, oh, no, not Elijah, but Jeremiah or maybe one of the other old prophets. You know, the good kind of prophets, the hellfire and brimstone, step on your toes till you bruised them bad kind of preachers. And so they get all their answers out on this easy, easy question for anyone to field. And then Jesus' second question, wait, if the first one was a softball over the middle of the plate, this is a Nolan Ryan heater high and inside. And he changes two things when he asks them, who do you say that I am? So he's no longer speaking about himself in the third person, the son of man. Who do people say the son of man is? He's saying, who am I? And not what do they say about it. Here's maybe even the more important part. Not to who do other people say that I am. Who do you all, my disciples, say that I am? And this is where Simon steps up and for all of his foibles for all of his faults for all of his failures this is one of the stories where simon looks good now hold on to that because we continue with this story next week and he looks real bad next week so just let him enjoy his moment in the limelight where he's looking good he steps forward in front of his friends and looks at jesus and says to him you are the messiah the son of the living God. Jesus, we're about to see in a moment, is going to praise him and bless him for this answer. But let's unpack it a little bit. Because Simon has just become the first one to see Jesus not just as a teacher, not just as a prophet, not just as someone like baptizing John was before he got beheaded, but to see Jesus as this singular individual, the Messiah or the Christ. By the way, quick review, same exact words. Messiah is the Hebrew word, Christ is the Greek word, and it means someone who has been anointed, touched by God with this purpose of redeeming and saving God's people Israel. And Simon doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, not only are you the Messiah, but you're the son of of the living God. So he's made this declaration. It sounds great. Jesus is well aware that even though Simon has made this declaration of faith, that Simon really doesn't understand what it means for Jesus to be Messiah, for Jesus to be the Christ. You have to understand, and don't judge Simon harshly because we would all be like him in this context. Simon and his people 
have known nothing but oppression at the hands of other empires for over seven centuries at this point. First the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and now it's the Roman Empire. So as the Jewish people have begun to develop and continue to teach this teaching of God is sending Messiah, God is sending Christ to be our liberator, to be the one who frees us, their understanding of that is not really so much in a spiritual sense, but that Messiah is the one who can conquer Caesar. Christ is the one who will be able to defeat the Roman Empire and finally grant us some sort of political or militaristic kind of freedom like we haven't known for generations. But Jesus is kind enough in this morning's story to simply take Simon with his words. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And as Jesus turns to Simon, we see him do one of the most significant things that can take place in biblical stories. He changes Simon's name. He says to him, blessed are you, praise you, Simon, son of Jonah. This is Simon, the older brother of the other fisherman there named Andrew. You, Simon, son of Jonah, will now be known as Peter. Your name is Petros because that word in Greek means the rock. And so he says, I'm changing your name from Simon. You're now Simon Peter because upon this rock, I'm going to build my, and here it is, first time ever in scripture. Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to tell you what the word is there because it'll be important just a little bit later. Ecclesia. That's what the church is, ecclesia. Those who are called out, that's just kind of a nice broad term. That's what church means, those who are called out. In this context, those who are called out because of this faith in Jesus as Messiah. And so I think we know enough about Simon Peter to know he's got a bit of an ego. Can you see him starting to look around at the other guys at this point? Do you hear that, fellas? I'm no longer simple Simon. I'm now Petros. I'm Peter. I'm the, I mean, like a Dwayne the Rock Johnson kind of mentality he's got here. I'm the rock, and he's going to build the church upon me. And then Jesus gets specific, and this is where I want to spend a little more time. This is the part I've never really focused on before. He tells Simon Peter that he's the rock upon which he's going to build this church and that the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Whatever you lock away here on earth will be locked away in heaven. Whatever you loose here on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so this is what Jesus says about Peter as the rock and his kind of faith. Now, just as a brief commentary note, I think most of us probably know that our Catholic friends, our Catholic brothers and sisters, look at this passage and they identify Peter now as the very first pope. That that's what's happening in this story. Jesus has drawn Peter out for his declaration of faith, said, you as an individual, you're the rock, I'm going to build my church upon you. You're the first pope in a sense, and then each generation after, we're going to have man after man fill this position of being pope all the way up to the present day where we have Pope Francis. Where I'm guessing most of us, and I certainly include myself in this, where we fall in interpreting this passage is a bit differently. Rather than taking this literally, that Peter the individual, that one man is the rock, and henceforward only one man will be the rock upon which the church is built, we understand Peter as an archetype, as an example, that he has made this confession of faith, and the people, the men and women who follow through with this confession of faith in Jesus as Christ and Messiah, they collectively represent the rock upon which the church will continue to be built. And that, that's the way that I look at this, not literally one man Peter as the rock, 
But each generation that comes after Peter, we continue as the church to be that rock that Christ begins with us to continue the work that Jesus began. All right, here's the part that was jumped out at me this week. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Hades itself is complicated. For the old timers hearing that word, it just simply means the, the Sheol, the place of the dead. It's where all dead people go. When you die, you die. Sheol's the place of the dead. For the younger generation, they've started believing Hades is this place called hell, a place where you go and you're punished forever and ever and ever for all the naughty things that you did while on earth. So realize that even this audience is going to have some confusion, the initial audience. Well, he's just talking about de death. Death is not going to be something that overcomes the church. Or if you go with hell, the place of punishment, sin is not going to be the place that overcomes the church. The way it's phrased, and you can correct me if you don't look at it this way, when I see the gates of Hades as the subject, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. I think of Hades as like attacking the church, hell attacking the, the church. But with some study and thought this week, that's not what it says. The word prevail. I got to do this one just for Bill and Susie because it was your last name that helped me remember this this week. That word of prevail, it will not prevail, catascu sisson. So I just remembered if you had a child named catascu and just add sisson at the end. <laughs> catascu sisson, that's what it means, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And what it's saying to us is not that Hades or hell is attacking the church, but that the church has a mission to attack the gates of Hades. And the gates of Hades... Gates of Sheol, place of the dead, gates of hell, place of what, however you want to interpret that. But those gates behind which there is nothing other than hopelessness and despair and death, that's not going to be able to hold the church back. The church, the people who trust in Christ, are the ones who are going to knock those gates down and bring this good news of salvation to all. Forgive me for taking a moment just to read a bit, but I want to get this part right because I've been thinking about some of the very difficult times that some of you are going through. It's inevitable for all of us that we go through extremely difficult times. And so the gates of Hades, the gates of hopelessness. We live among a people whom we love greatly, when the gates of Hades threaten to imprison them in despair, we are the rock that rolls forward with a hope that transcends the deepest darkness. When the gates of Hades stagnate others in the malaise of apathy, we are the rock that rolls forward with a vision of life filled with purpose and mission. When the gates of Hades lock those we love into anger and consume them with desires for vengeance, we are the rock that rolls forward, offering peace through forgiveness and humility. For you see, we have such great love within this church and for this wider community. And when we witness people we love going through the most difficult times, in a metaphorical or symbolic sense, it is as if the gates of Hades, the gates of hopelessness, are holding them back from light and love. The church is not the rock that is static and stays put and just witnesses it. We are the rock that rolls. And we roll through those gates with all the light and love the gospel has granted to us. Any kind of teaching about the church is called ecclesiology. Remember that word from earlier, ecclesia, those who are called out ecclesiology, teachings about the church. So I'm asking you to consider a rock and roll ecclesiology this morning. 
And we begin with a faith like Peter's, naive as his was, as we're going to see next week. But we hold on to that faith as the vision that we have for all of life. And love cannot help but compel us to go to those in darkness and despair, to go to those even in the midst of anger and rage, and not with arrogance, but with humility and a heart of service to do what we can to show them love. Even though the Gospels hardly say anything about the church, I think you know the book right after them, Acts, and then 13 letters by Paul, there's a whole lot about the church in there. And what it tells us is that the church becomes whatever is needed for each person so that by whatever means necessary, they can know the love of God that we have experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, to be all things to all people so that by all possible means, the love of God may be known. I imagine back in 1956, when they finished up that vegetable, there might have been some sermons against rock and roll. Well, I stand before you now and I'm preaching a rock and roll ecclesiology. Amen. <laughs>